Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with Audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. Princeton, New Jersey is one of the safest towns in America and home to Princeton University. But in 1989, multiple stabbings rattled the residents' sense of security. I'm Charlie and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to day five of 12 days of Crime Lines. Like I've already explained, I chose a bunch of cases off my suggestion list that are either too short for a Crime Lines episode, ones that need more attention because they're unsolved, or ones that were sent to me as a suggestion from a listener. And this is actually pretty much all of those things, and it includes multiple cases that remain unsolved. This is an interesting set of cases. Heather sent it over to me, and I want to say thank you for doing so. We are going to talk about two unsolved murders and other attacks that happened within a year of each other. They are similar crimes with similar MOs, but it's not clear if they're connected. Let's jump into it. The first attack we are going to talk about occurred on January 2nd, 1989. An 18-year-old Princeton University student was reading in the library at Wilcox Hall, which is on campus. Normally, the library is staffed over the holiday break by a student library employee, but on this night, there was actually no one working. The employee on the previous shift said he came to the end of his shift, No one showed up to take over, so he just went home. The young woman was reading quietly, alone, when someone came up to her from behind around 10 p.m., grabbed her around the neck, stabbed her once in the back with a sharp object, and then fled the scene. Few details have been released about what happened, so it's not entirely clear how she did things like get help. But thankfully, she did. She was rushed to the Princeton Medical Center, where she underwent surgery to repair damage to her right kidney. Because the attack was from behind, all she could provide was a vague description of the attacker's clothing. She had no idea who stabbed her or who would want to. The investigators at the time said they did not believe this was premeditated. There was absolutely no reason someone would think the victim was in the library alone, since the library is always staffed and the victim just so happened to be there. This isn't a vast, huge library either. It's almost more like a reading room. Anyone coming or going would expect that staff working there would see them. It seemed like a crime of opportunity, but why randomly stab someone? The victim was not robbed or sexually assaulted. The motive for the stabbing is entirely unknown, and the case is technically unsolved, though there is a suspect who we will talk about later. He didn't come into the picture until about a year and a half after this. But there isn't much out there about this case in particular, and I only came across it when reading about the next case. Almost exactly three months after the library stabbing, on April 3rd, 1989, Jeb Stewart left his office to head to his mother's house. He ran the Princeton newspaper Town Topics that had been founded by his parents. 
He had taken it over from them, and the office was just down the street from where his mother, 74-year-old Emily Sissy Stewart, lived. Walking down to have lunch with his mother was something Jeb occasionally did, but when he got to her house, she wasn't home. He assumed she was off doing something else and went back to his office. When Jeb didn't find her at home later and couldn't get in touch with her, he called the police to report her missing. Sissy's sister was also concerned after not hearing from her, so on April 4th, she went over to her house to check on her. It seems like Sissy being reported missing and her sister going to the house happened at nearly the same time. The sister went into the house and she found the door from the kitchen to the cellar locked from the kitchen side of the door. This was an old house, so the way you would lock the internal doors was with a skeleton key. So anyone in the basement wouldn't be able to open the door, but the person on the kitchen side could. The sister unlocked the door and went down into the basement. In a small storage room, she found Sissy lying face down on the stone floor, having been stabbed to death. Like the victim in the library, Sissy had been stabbed in the back. This time, though, she was stabbed not once, but five times between her shoulder blades. She was then left for dead. When the killer or killers left the house, they padlocked the wooden door that led from the basement to the backyard, which is something Sissy never did. The detail about the basement door that led to the kitchen being locked wasn't released right away. It was something that was initially held back from the media. While we can only guess why these two doors were both locked, I do have two theories. One was to delay the discovery of the body by trying to prevent access to the basement. But I lean towards my second theory, and that was to prevent Sissy from escaping the basement. Not that anyone could reasonably assume Sissy would survive that attack, but if she did, she was locked in the basement, unable to get out to seek aid. Sissy was found fully dressed and holding her eyeglasses in her hand. Based on when she was last seen, it's believed she was killed the day before her son came by on Sunday, April 2nd. That is three months to the day after the attack in the library. There was no weapon left at the scene, there were no fingerprints, and there were no witnesses, even though Sissy lived in an active neighborhood. It's believed Sissy was working in the yard when she went into the cellar to get some supplies or tools. She was stabbed while her back was turned, meaning the person either snuck up on her or was someone she trusted enough to turn her back to. But either way, the attack was swift. She didn't have time to defend herself, and all of the items in the basement area and her garden tools were untouched, so we know there was really no struggle. Unfortunately, none of her neighbors had noticed anyone in the yard with her that day. There was also nothing stolen from the house, and much like the first stabbing, there was no apparent motive. The only possible motive discovered in the course of the investigation was inheritance. Sissy was not a poor woman by any means, and she never had been. When she died, she left her two sons a sizable inheritance. The house alone was worth $600,000 in 1989 money. To adjust for inflation, just double that number. And that's just the house. That doesn't account for any actual cash money or any other assets. One of Sissy's sons, Charles, called this suspicion idle town gossip. He did understand where it was coming from, but it was incredibly frustrating because he felt like people weren't interested in finding the true killer because they were too busy side-eyeing the Stewart brothers. At the time of the murder, we do know Jeb lived in town. He ran the local paper, after all, but her other son, Charles, lived outside of Boston. Idle town gossip aside, the police did and do believe that Sissy knew her killer 
and her killer was familiar with the house, familiar enough to lock that kitchen door to the basement in advance, familiar enough that their presence wouldn't have caught Sissy off guard or prevented her from turning her back on them. But to add to some of the confusion in this case of what happened to Sissy, the night before Sissy's body was found, but after she had likely been killed, a friend of hers, Annie Ryan, also had an intruder in her home. Annie had worked as a maid for Sissy Stewart, and the two had remained friends. Annie, a widow, lived alone in Trenton, New Jersey. On the night of the break-in, Annie heard a sound on her back porch and she called the police. Then she went to investigate it herself, and when she opened the door, a man forced his way in, pushing her back. Annie ran to her bedroom and grabbed the loaded 38 caliber she kept under a pillow. She fired at the floor to scare the man away, which worked. As he fled, she fired again, hitting the doorframe. She said the man stopped in the yard and yelled something about how many shots did she have left, but then the police arrived and he took off. Most of the news about the break-in at Annie's place was wrapped up in the police having taken an 81-year-old woman's gun away from her. The gun was unregistered since her husband had bought it before New Jersey's gun laws required registration, and after the law changed, she never went and registered it. Annie did end up getting her gun back, but she became an example for anti-gun control politicians. She was a woman who successfully defended herself thanks to her gun that just happened to be in her possession illegally. Now, Annie didn't care about any of that. She just wanted her gun back for her protection. She lived in the inner city, and she felt unsafe without it, and now she felt especially unsafe after having a close call with an intruder. For our purposes, the question we have is, what are the odds two women who knew each other would have some type of home invasion within 24 hours? Aside from the fact that they knew each other, they did have very little in common. They didn't live that close to each other. From Sissy's upscale Princeton neighborhood to Annie's inner city Trenton apartment was about a 20-minute drive, but worlds away otherwise. Annie also wasn't attacked, but in fairness, she did pull a gun on the man, so we don't know what he intended. His motive for breaking in isn't known. There was no connection found between the two incidents, but it is definitely an odd coincidence. Over the summer, those in Princeton were on edge. They had this random stabbing on a student at the beginning of the year, and then with Sissy's murder, they had the first homicide in 11 years. And it wasn't just anyone, it was a prominent figure in the community. Some articles refer to Sissy as a Princeton socialite. So the first murder in years of a high-profile citizen, this was the case everyone was talking about. And then in September, there was another stabbing. While it didn't happen in Princeton, the victim was a teacher at a school in Princeton. Marjorie Schicker grew up in a family that prioritized education and athleticism, Marjorie's mother had received a doctorate in education and promoted physical fitness by coaching and sponsoring various youth sports activities, things that would define the last three years of Marjorie's life as well. Marjorie attended the Hun School of Princeton, which is a prestigious college preparatory school in Princeton, New Jersey, that I could never afford. She graduated from there in 1975, pursued an education in art, and had a career as a commercial artist. Around 1986, Marjorie returned to the Hun School, this time as a teacher. In addition to teaching high school photography and middle school art, like her mother, Marjorie coached a variety of sports in addition to teaching. She coached field hockey, swimming, and tennis. On the evening of Wednesday, September 20th, 1989, Marjorie went to her parents' house to have dinner. On the way home, she decided to stop at the Cost Cutter Grocery Store in Hamilton Township. 
This was about 20 minutes south of Princeton, and like Princeton, it has an incredibly low crime rate. While they don't average zero murders like Princeton does, murder is still rare, even though they do have double the population of Princeton. After shopping, Marjorie went out to her car at 8.30 p.m. She was putting her groceries into her trunk when a man approached her. Most of the witnesses just saw Marjorie's grocery bags fly from her hands, likely as she was trying to defend herself. But by the time they looked to see what was going on, Marjorie sat down on the curb, bleeding, and the attacker was long gone. But there was at least one witness who saw and heard more than that. It was reported that a man, likely Hispanic, demanded Marjorie's purse. There was a short struggle before the man fled. This struggle was actually the man repeatedly stabbing Marjorie in the abdomen. None of those wounds were fatal, but then he slashed her throat. He was seen running and jumping into a two-tone van with two other men in it. By the time first responders got there, Marjorie was unconscious. She was transported to the hospital where she was pronounced dead at only 31 years old. The proposed motive here was a robbery gone wrong, which is obvious if the man had demanded her purse first. But the murder itself, the repeated stabbing, then slashing the throat, and having a getaway vehicle with multiple other people in it nearby— just seems a bit much for a random robbery. It doesn't rule it out, obviously, but it does bring in the question of maybe there being another motive. And because of Marjorie's link to Princeton, the media reports started discussing connections between the three stabbings that had occurred that year. The connections, however, were superficial when you really look at it. In the column listing the similarities, we have that they were all women, they were all stabbed, and in all three cases, the attacker took the weapon with them, and they all had ties to Princeton. But the differences are pretty glaring. Yes, Marjorie taught at a school in Princeton, but she didn't live there, and she wasn't there when she was attacked. The victim profiles were pretty different, too. Sissy Stewart was a 74-year-old socialite, Marjorie a 31-year-old teacher, and the other victim was a teenage college student. And then there were the locations. Marjorie was in a parking lot with witnesses around, Sissy was alone in her own house, and the other victim was alone in a public space, a library. And the circumstances are different. Victim number one was believed to be a random stabbing with no other motive. Sissy was believed to have been targeted by someone she knew, and Marjorie's case was being considered an attempted robbery. I can see why they explored the connections between the cases. These were low-crime areas that saw similar crimes within nine months of each other. It was worth looking into, but these remain separate investigations. And then there was a fourth stabbing in Princeton. This one happened in June 1990. This victim, like the first, did survive. And more than that, there was an arrest. The arrest happened because the police were very nearby when the attack occurred. There had been reports in the spring of 1990 that there was a peeping Tom in the neighborhood around Oakland Street. So the police presence in the area on June 8th, 1990, was pretty high, and there were officers staking out a specific house that night. During the stakeout, the officers heard a woman scream and followed the sounds to a nearby home. Inside was a woman named Anne who had been taking a shower when a masked man ran in and began stabbing her. He stabbed her in the side and on her arm. 
The officers actually saw the man run from the house as the woman was screaming, and they chased him. The man ran into a home, which turned out to be his own, and he was found by police hiding inside. He was still wet from the water from Anne's shower when they arrested him. His name was Gerald Jeffrard. They believe that he was the peeping Tom in the neighborhood and had peeped on Anne before deciding to enter the home and attack her. Gerald was convicted in this case and given a 20-year prison sentence. He has since died. There has been debate over whether he was ever considered a suspect in Sissy Stewart's murder. At least one investigator denied it, but according to Gerald's attorney, Gerald was absolutely questioned about it and even given a polygraph, which he passed. He was at least somewhat considered a person of interest, if this is true, though he denied any involvement. Another of Gerald's attorneys said Gerald had nothing to do with the murder and then placed the blame squarely on the police investigation as to why they had no solid suspects in the case. She pointed out that the murder was close up and bloody. So why was there no solid forensic evidence? There are concerns that the Princeton Borough Police were just not well-versed in homicide investigations and had insufficient experience. Like I said, most years, Princeton has no murders. And with this being 1989, this was the first murder in Princeton since DNA technology became a part of investigations and court cases. How much training did they have in collecting and preserving forensic evidence and did they take advantage of the state crime scene investigators to the fullest extent? Sissy Stewart's son Charles believes that Gerald Giffard killed his mother. In 1992, he produced a documentary for HBO called My Mother's Murder, and it puts this forward as a theory. But Gerald's family has accused the Stuarts of deflecting from their own family, and it became an issue of class conflict. The Jeffrards were a working-class immigrant family from Haiti. The Stuarts were a wealthy, high-profile local family. It's not unlike the conversations that happened around Susan Smith a few years later. She had killed her two sons and blamed a vague black carjacker who never existed. It was and is widely believed she chose this description on purpose because she knew people would believe a black man did this over a white mother. In this case, there was no evidence against Gerald. He was never charged and is not considered currently a suspect. Of the three stabbings in 1989, the one that was possibly Gerald would be the one in the library, a random attack of a college student. After Gerald's arrest, the peeping in the neighborhood stopped, as did the Princeton stabbings. In 1991, we did get a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look at the investigations into both Sissy and Marjorie's murders because a complaint was lodged against Paul T. Koenig Jr., who was the Mercer County prosecutor overseeing the cases. The people who were complaining were the police chiefs in each city, Princeton Borough and Hamilton Township. They were not happy with how Koenig was handling things. They claimed in their complaint to the state attorney general that Koenig interfered too much. He seemed to have zeroed in on Gerald Jeffrard as the prime suspect in Sissy Stewart's murder, and he wrote to the chief over the investigation telling him, to focus on finding links between Gerald and Sissy. But they had looked for the links and couldn't find any. Pushing them to keep looking wasn't going to change that. The Princeton Borough Police said that Koenig also hadn't taken some of their evidence seriously. For instance, they had a language expert analyze the writings of a member of the Stewart family, the expert said some things were phrased in a way that he thought hinted at this being, quote, a family affair. 
The police have not named the expert or which family member was the writer they were investigating. We just know that the police felt the expert's evidence was being unfairly discounted by the county prosecutor because English was his second language, even though he was a trained linguist. Since we haven't seen any of the information on this analysis, I do hesitate to put too much into it. We don't even know what source material the expert used in his evaluation. We don't know who the expert was or his specific training. I'm only bringing up this analysis not as evidence, but to give some context to the complaint against the DA. In the end, the state attorney general opted not to intervene in the situation, and the various investigators were left to work out their differences. After Charles Stewart's documentary on his mother's murder came out in the early 90s, there was another flurry of media attention, mostly on the documentary, and almost none of it even mentioned Marjorie Shecker's case. Then in 1996, a Trenton fireman named Samuel Naro filed a defamation suit, and this got Marjorie's case back in the papers. He said in his complaint that two newspapers had named him as a suspect in Marjorie's murder because he had a passing resemblance to a composite sketch. More than just naming him, they published his photograph on the front page. And this was, in his view, beyond reckless. From the start, the police said they had witnesses to Marjorie's murder who gave conflicting descriptions. So honestly, I was surprised a composite was even attempted or released. We've seen other cases where they'll attempt a composite sketch, but it's so shaky that they withhold it because they don't want people to discount their own recollections because of an unreliable sketch. But apparently in this case... They made the sketch, they released it, and somewhere in there, Samuel's name got brought into it. Samuel lost the case because he couldn't prove actual malice, but he did appeal right up to the Supreme Court who declined to hear it. I am using his full name here only because he wrote a book about his experience of being publicly accused of a crime that he did not commit. It's something I, as a podcaster, have become increasingly mindful of when I cover unsolved cases or I'm discussing theories of a crime. These are real people. They aren't characters on TV. They are not in a whodunit novel. There is a real impact to being publicly accused, including financial issues like job loss, but also the social consequences when friends and neighbors start thinking, maybe you killed somebody. The book is called Unbalanced Justice by Samuel L. Naro. If you want to read more, I will put the name of it in the episode description box so you don't have to try to remember it. After this, Marjorie's case largely fades from the media. Even when Sissy Stewart's murder comes up, it's often not even mentioned, making me think that the link between the cases has been completely ruled out. In 2019, on the 30-year anniversary of Sissy Stewart's murder, it was announced through New Jersey Advanced Media that for years the investigators have had two suspects in that crime. They won't say much about them except that they were both Princeton University students at the time. They were both male and both familiar with the house. They said there is not enough evidence to go to trial just yet, and their names and backgrounds have not been made public. But some speculation here, it is my understanding that Sissy had a grandchild enrolled at Princeton at the time of her murder. I'm not saying that the grandchild is on the suspect list, but it would explain possibly why students were familiar with her house. They may be connected to her through her grandchild. The murder of Emily Sissy Stewart has been described as the hottest cold case because of how much a reinvestigation has uncovered and it did develop these two solid suspects. To me, it sounds like this is one of those cases that just needs one or two more pieces to complete the puzzle and bring justice for Emily Stewart. One of the things that really hit me as I was going through these cases is just the idea that there were multiple people committing stabbings in the area around that same time. It's not clear to me if the first stabbing, the one in the library, was definitively connected to 
Gerald Giffard or not. But the two murders of Marjorie and Sissy were not, and they were not connected to each other. As unlikely as it seems, it appears that in a year and a half, this area that had almost no violent crime had three different men committing stabbings. And the two most serious of these, the murders of Sissy Stewart and Marjorie Shecker, remain unsolved 32 years later. If you have any information on the murder of Emily Sissy Stewart, call the Princeton Police at 609-921-2100. And if you have any information on the murder of Marjorie Shecker, call the Hamilton Township Police at 609 581 Four zero zero zero. These numbers will be in the show notes. You love podcasts, the stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.